sec. Okay. All right, so I, uh, I, I made a promise to Coach Pete that I'd give a shout out to FCA. So before I start, uh, FCA is, stands for Fellowship of Christian Athletes. We meet Thursday morning at 7.30 NPR. Anyone is welcome. So yeah, for those of you who don't know, my name is Jacob. I'm a senior here at Bellevue, here at Bellevue Christian. Um, oh, I think I know most of you, but if not, I should. That said, uh, my chapel is going to be a little bit on the deep side. So just kind of like, I guess as a precaution, um, I'll have a lot of pictures that, well, a few pictures anyways, that um, involve death and sickness and that sort of stuff. So if that is something that's of uh, particular uh, hardness or is, is really difficult for you, two options. One, I guess not look. The, and not, nothing is like medically gruesome. No arms are chopped off or anything. But, um, or also, step out. Feel free if you want. I'd encourage you to stay. I mean, ultimately, life is terminal and... You know, everyone kind of has to faith, face death and stuff, so I think what I have to say is important. Uh, so to start off with, um, I think everyone probably has heard, uh, you know, like the speaking advice, if you're speaking from a public audience, imagine the audience like naked or in their underwear. That's kind of weird, in my opinion. I don't know. It never really has worked for me, so I, don't know, I think I'm going to do one better. So, I don't know, that's a picture of me vacuuming the house when I was four. <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, next slide. <laughs> yeah, sorry, that's a weird transition. I mean, I couldn't really say anything like serious with that background. So, um, I guess before I'm sorry, I'm just gonna start us off with a word of prayer. So, dearly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for the opportunity to uh, come and speak to my school community, Lord. Uh, thank you for the opportunity and freedom that I can. Not everyone um, is able to. So. I thank you for that, and I pray that you bless what I'm going to say. In your name, amen. Okay, so um, to give you guys a heads up of where I'm going with this, I, there's really three main, well, I'm basically just going to share with you guys kind of my life. There's really three main stories I'll share, and then uh, I'll try to tie everything at the end. I mean, uh, I think people get tired of being preached to constantly, so that's not necessarily my goal here, but I have to have some sort of a message, so. Um, so to start off, the first story is kind of more contextual, the last two I'll extrapolate on. Um, so I, leading up to my birth, that is of me in case you're wondering, when I was uh, born, I, was, I had a thing called meconiomelias, which is more or less glorified constipation, uh, which doesn't seem like it's that big of a deal, but 80% um, of people with meconiomelias are diagnosed with a disease, genetic disease called cystic fibrosis, and just to explain to you guys what that is, um, well, it's a couple things. One, it's the most uh, common rare disease in America, so it's classified as a rare disease, but it's the most common of them. And it's also the most common terminal genetic disease, meaning it ends, it res, you know, the end result is death. Um, and what CF is, is a uh, mutation in a gene that controls sodium chloride channels in your uh, body. So as a result, people with CF have um, primarily thick mucus, which affects the respiratory and digestive systems. Um, and so as a result, there's a, a lot of complications and a lot of therapies that uh, need to be done. Right now, the life expectancy is 40, so definitely a lot better than other illnesses. But it's not really a passive disease in the sense you're diagnosed, you live your life, hope for the best and die. There's a lot of um, maintenance, I guess, so that you don't you know, you put off death for as long as possible. So ever since I was born, um, I've, I've been doing about an hour and a half of therapies per day, so about half hour in the morning, hour at night, taking about 35 pills per day, um, on top of different hospitalizations and stuff, usually about one per year for uh, lung infections, which is ultimately what kills a person with CF. The uh, recurring lung infections destroy the lungs and you suffocate. It's kind of, kind of bleak. Um, 
and so just for a couple of statistics for you, because I, I don't know, I think they're cool. So uh, the first is that if I live until I'm 80, I will have consumed over 1.1 million pills and will have spent 41,000 hours of my life doing therapies, which comes out to be four and a half years. Um, so yeah, I don't know. Um, so yeah, I was, um, I was born with cornemilia, diagnosed with CF, had a surgery to remove the meconium which is basically the baby's first poop, poop, um, have a big scar on my stomach. And so, you know, a few years, well, most of my life, I've been pretty healthy. And then come around to uh, freshman year of high school, um, I, uh, well, come around to freshman year of high school, my doctors decided to put me on a, a new therapy. And I, I'll refer to, you know, I'm going to unfortunately shine, um, my stories don't look favorably upon doctors, so I do just want to say, like, I love my doctors. They're, you know, they're incredible. They, uh, um, well, I mean, they've they've literally saved my life several times. So, um, obviously, trust them. So, uh, I was I was put on a therapy um, of high of high dose ibuprofen, which is more or less Advil, and uh, the reasoning was you reduce inflammation in the lungs and hopefully, you know, improve lung function. I was put on six ibuprofen twice per day, so total 12 per day, which is a lot, meaning I really couldn't feel <laughs> like pain uh, for obvious reasons. Um, so yeah, I was on that for, for, for about six months. Go into the CF clinic, you know, I, I go in to my doctor about at least every quarter um, on top of blood draws and all that sort of good stuff. And uh, PFTs were down, so PFT stands for pulmonary function test, it's basically um, a machine that I breathe into, and it spits out a number that tells you what your lung function is. And so my lung function was really, really drastically, like it was like I don't know, it was like half or two thirds. It was it was cut quite a bit. And so you're like, well, hospitalization for you, yippee, you know, that whole stuff. I've been through it, so it's you know not a huge deal. Um, but they were down quite a bit, so they decided to get they decided to get an X-ray. The doctors being they, and uh, the next slide isn't of that X-ray, but it's of an X-ray after a few weeks. A few weeks after, I was getting better, so I'll throw that up there. Um, unfortunately, I couldn't find a picture of the x-ray from that, from that afternoon, but um, if you can imagine, that's my left lung, other is my right lung. So at the time, if I remember correctly, my right lung was about what it is there. Okay, sorry, so white, white means that there's fluid. Black is like air. So in a regular person's x-ray, I should have thrown a picture of this up there. You should just have two black lungs. Um, so the one on the right is bad. The one on the left at the time looked about like that. So, you know, I, I was at about three quarters, you know, with fluid in my chest, which is not good. On top of, so I was pneumonia. On top of what's called a pleural effusion. Am I, am I not speaking to the mic the entire time? Okay. Um, and so, uh, on top of pleural effusion, which is basically when the when fluid goes in between your lungs and the cavity of your chest, so pneumonia and pleural effusion. So I was more or less drowning, which sucked. Um, but the crazy thing was that I wasn't in any pain. I wasn't in any. Um, I, I mean, I had a little bit of a difficult time breathing, so that was kind of strange. So you know, we're trying to figure it out. It turned out the ibuprofen numbed everything, which sucked. So they stick me in the hospital. Uh, they put me on two antibiotics. One is tobramycin, which is a fairly typical antibiotic that I get put on when I'm in the hospital. And the other was meropenem. And uh, meropenem is like as you know, as high as potent, so to speak, as antibiotics get. Like it's, you've you've know you've made it when they put you on a, a meropenem. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, a few days go by, and nothing, nothing, uh, nothing hugely. Um, increased in terms of PFDs or anything. And I kind of started getting worse. So, you know, they took me off the ibuprofen. Pain kind of started catching up to me. Um, I mean, I really couldn't breathe. Imagine, you know, taking like a little coffee straw and trying to breathe through that. That was, you know, that's kind of how it felt for a couple of weeks. It, got, it was really, really, uh, really bad. The, uh, the doctors were um, contemplating putting a chest tube um, in my chest. Uh, and you guys have probably seen them on like medical shows or whatnot. I mean, it's a tube that they stick in your, your lung, drain fluid, 
Uh, they, they didn't ultimately, their, their reasoning was uh, it wouldn't accomplish much. I mean, whatever came out would just fill back in. So, um, so yeah, that was tough. And then, I mean, I don't want to say that I was, was almost, that I almost died, but um, that my doctors definitely were starting to approach my parents about, uh, at least for the first, you know, first few days, about the possibility that, you know, things might not get a whole lot better, things go downhill. Um, but. Obviously, I'm here. I made it. Um, so that's good. <laughs> um, so yeah, so year goes by. I, you know, well, I was out of school for I think about four weeks in the hospital for a solid, um, I don't know, week and a half. Came home, IV antibiotics. Um, got better. Year goes by. Um, Sophomore year, spring, I think some of you guys might know where the story is headed. Um, doing homework, and I got a call from my, uh, who was my call from? My call, my call, no, my call was from my mom. My mom said, you know, your dad had a heart attack. He was, uh, he was at work, working out in the gym. His arm went numb, which is bad. So he drove himself over to the fire department. Um, they checked him out, and they said, you're having a heart attack. Gonna take you over to the hospital. The, so they, they ambulanced him over, um, got the stent placed, alleviate, or, you know, reduced the strain on the heart. Things were looking good. So mom said, you know, grandma's going to come pick you up. So she came, picked me up, dropped my, uh, well, drove my sister and I uh, to the hospital. And, you know, we get there and uh, see, you know, see her dad. He's, he's doing okay. He's in recovery. Um, it was a pretty big, you know, deal. So he obviously wasn't feeling very well. Um, kind of talked to the doctor, and he was like, well, relatively speaking, like, everything should be okay. I mean, it was a pretty, it was a pretty big heart attack. And the thing that was really strange was that, I mean, he was a younger, younger adult male, um, not overweight, was healthy. So, you know, in terms of if someone's going to have a heart attack, this is who, you know, you want to have it because, you know, the outlook is, outlook is really good. We got in there, um, fixed everything. So things should be okay. I think that's great. And then that night, where uh, you know, family's kind of trickling in, uh, you know, saying hi to my dad, you know, whatever. And then I, uh, I remember I was just kind of sitting in the waiting room. We hear code blue, and for those of you that don't know what code blue is, it means that a heart is stopped, person's not breathing, resuscitation. And uh, I said code blue, South Tower. I thought we were in the North Tower, so I'm like, oh, well. To be honest, actually, I kind of prayed for the family that was uh, the code blue was called on, so you know, because I knew I knew what it was. Um, Turned out it was my dad, and everything was fine. He, uh, his heart did stop. Doctor said it was to be expected because of all the strain put on his heart. Um, and things were, you know, it was gonna be okay. They were ready for it. They resuscitated him fine, um, and you know, things were, things were as good as could be. Um, and that night, the doctor kind of just went over his, uh, my dad's, you know, treatment plan. And he said hey, they were gonna do a whole bunch of stuff, but one of which included putting him on putting him on anticoagulants, which is, you know, blood thinners, uh, to help reduce the strain on the heart, you know, break up the blood clot that it forms. And I asked him, um, do they, you know, completely eliminate blood clots? He said no, but the body gets rid of them. And so I asked him if um, his doctor, you know, well, should there be a, a CT scan done of his brain to uh, check and see if any of them, you know, blood clots go to his brain, causing a stroke? And he said no, you know, that, that doesn't ever really happen. So that was, you know, I took it, I took it at face value and uh, said goodbye to my dad, said, we, said I loved him, went home. Next day was, uh, I, meant to, I was going to go see my dad, but we had a track meet in Linden, so wasn't able to. And then Thursday afternoon, I'm like, all right, obviously you need to go see my dad. He was still in the hospital. And so, uh, you know, things were still fine. Like, you know, no, no new news. No news is good news in that situation. Um, so during lunch, I get a call from the office saying your uncle is here to pick you up to go see your dad. And I'm like, well, is everything okay? And, you know, not, you know, I didn't really say anything. So I'm like, well, okay. So I go in there. And I mean, the last I heard, my dad was doing fine. So, you know, I was like, well, I don't want to miss, <laughs> I won't have to miss school. So can I just go and see him after uh, school gets out? You know, we got done an hour and a half. And they were thinking, no, you should, you should go see him. Thinking, okay. So my uh, uncle comes, pick my sister and I up drives a few blocks, puts the car in park, and says, your dad 
is brain dead, which was unfortunate. Uh, the next picture is of my dad that afternoon um, in, his, in his hospital bed. Uh, I won't have it up for very long, so if you're, you know, if that kind of thing really bothers you, you're welcome not to look. But, uh, so he's on life support, he has a ventilator. Um, just for what it's worth, there's a difference between being in a coma and being brain dead. People wake up from being in comas, it's, uh, you know, the unmedical way of saying it's a very, very long sleep. But brain death is when there's no brain activity. Um, so people wake up from comas. People don't wake up from brain death. Um, what had happened was is that the, uh, the anticoagulants had caused a blood vessel in his brain to burst um, and swell up to an unsurvivable point. So so where was God in all this? That's kind of, uh, kind of where I'm trying to go here with my chapel. Um, um, I think I'm not going to really try to address why, does, why do bad things happen, why do people die, um, why do people get sick. Uh, there's a whole lot of theological answers. I don't know, you know, the entire, the full answer to that question. I don't think anyone really does. Um, so I'm going to focus more on uh, where is God when bad things happen, because um, I think people can take these kinds of situations and go in two different directions. They can either think, you know, God isn't there, or they can kind of think He is. So, first, uh, first place that I think. God was was uh, in my relationships. One um, one pretty powerful thing I think about that afternoon is after after my uncle told me that my dad was brain dead. Um, is it, well, first I was just in complete shock. Like I mean, my brain knew that you know I would never see him alive, um, but like you know my emotions didn't. So it didn't. I wasn't crying. I was just like staring like what? This isn't happening, kind of thing. Um, totally unexpected. I mean. In a matter of about 48 hours, you know, went from life being completely normal to he had a heart attack to he's fine again to he's dead. Um, so it was just a whirlwind kind of going on. Um, so I wasn't sure what to do. So, I mean, we were driving to the hospital down in Overlake, Overlake Hospital. Um, so I called Garrett. I think most of you guys know Garrett. Um, tell him what had happened. He conveys it to our other group of friends. Um, they say, you know, we'll head down to the hospital. Uh, so we get there, family is, you know, obviously really sad. Um, and, you know, within 20, 30 minutes, friends arrive, arrived, um, family, friends, family, I mean, there was, there was a lot of people, uh, probably, you know, 40 or 50, it was, it was, it was significant, it was, uh, um, it's pretty touching. I, I mean, I don't remember a ton about, you know, the next few days, but one of the things I definitely remember is just us, um, me and my friends and their dads, just, you know, standing in a circle praying. Um, and I, I don't really remember entirely what, you know, people said, but um, just having people there present, having friends present, having family present, um, just, you know, I saw God in that. Um, and I absolutely believe that God puts certain people in our lives at certain points um, for a reason, so that ultimately we can see his glory and so that we can make it through uh, difficult times. Um, and I absolutely saw that, and my doctor saw that, or my dad's doctor saw that. He, uh, he wasn't a Christian, but, or I don't know if he is or not anymore now, but um, he, uh, he said, and, and he was an older guy, I mean, he's been in the, He's been a doctor for a long time, and he said that he has never seen uh, the kind of support and the kind of, you know, the number of people that came to support a family after, a, you know, such a loss like that. Um, and, you know, I just thought, you know, that was a fantastic, um, fantastic moment, in my opinion, because, you know, not only did I think God was there, um, but, you know, so did he. So did, so, so did someone who, you know, didn't believe in Christ. So the next, the next point that I have is medicine. God was in medicine. And this is kind of weird because ultimately my dad died. Ultimately, 
you know, I will die, you will die, we all will die, kind of sad, I'm sorry to depress you, it's a fact of life. Um, but the fact is that we live in a fallen world, um, and things and people die, but that doesn't mean that God isn't there. Um, I think, I think you kind of have to look a little bit deeper into the situation, because if it wasn't for modern medicine, um, my dad would have had his heart attack, and from the moment, you know, it would have been within a couple hours that he would have died, you know, from the moment of him knowing that he was, that his arm went numb and him actually passing away. Um, and so as a result of that, I mean, I remember the last thing that I said to him uh, up leading up until his heart attack was uh, a text where I said, um, one sec, what did I say? I was like, please put my fridge in the dinner. I'll be home soon. Um, just, you know, I got home late the previous, previous day. Um, but because of medicine, the last thing that I was able to tell my dad was that I loved him. And while it sucks that he died, uh, the fact that my last words <laughs> weren't, please put my food in the fridge, <laughs> uh, I think was, all, was, was just fantastic. I mean, it's tough because a, a lot of the times when, you know, sudden deaths occur, a lot of people say, you know, I wasn't able to say goodbye. Um, and I was, so you know, I'm I'm absolutely grateful for that situation, for, for being able to do so, not for the situation, but for being able to uh, say goodbye. Um, and uh, the next slide, well, let me just put it up. This is a graph of uh, the life expectancy for people with cystic fibrosis. X-axis, you have the year and uh, the number of years on the Y. Um, 70 years ago, people died within a few weeks of being diagnosed. Uh, it wasn't until 1938 that cystic fibrosis was even an actual uh, known disease. The saying used to be that if you looked your kid and they tasted salty, like on their skin, uh, that they'd be dead within a month. Um, but now, 70 years later, um, life expectancy is 40. The median life expectancy is 40. Um, medications are coming out at a rate unprecedented, and for the first time ever this past year, uh, more, there are more adults with cystic fibrosis than kids, which is huge because it means that people are living longer um, than they have ever before. Uh, uh, so I think, I think kind of tying this into the to the Bible and biblically, it, it's interesting because it often goes, we all, we all hear uh, the miracles of Jesus healing people. And, um, you know, people sometimes say, well, why, does, why doesn't that happen anymore, you know? Uh, I think there's a lot of answers, but one is that you have to realize the people that Jesus healed, it's not like they lived forever. I mean, they still died, right? Um, and there's a, so, uh, I think that one of the miracles is medicine, that we, you know, we as people have the ability to learn about the human body and perform surgery and intervene medically and um, as a result, you know, extend people's lives. And just like uh, in Jesus' time when he did heal people, um, you know, kind of the purpose of that was to spread the word of God, um, to draw closer to God. And I think that that's very much still true today. Uh, in the sense that the miracle of medicine allows people to have more time to find God if they don't know him, um, and if they do, to share with other people their story so that others, you know, may find him and so that people may grow closer to him. And so, while inevitably we all die, the fact that we are able to um, allow more people to come to Christ and to know Christ more, I think, is God in medicine. Next one oh. is it myself, and I'm not, you know, I'm not going to talk about myself a ton here, um, but I, I am absolutely thankful to uh, the Holy Spirit for um, being with me through, through, you know, both, you know, having CF and through my dad's death. Um, I mean, knowing that you won't see your dad again sucks. Knowing, um, you know knowing that you will inevitably die and having to kind of be faced more with that, having a terminal illness is also tough. Um, 
I mean, it's difficult because with, cyst with cystic fibrosis, I mean, you can be, like, thankfully, right now I'm very healthy. And you can be very healthy, and then, you know, things can turn really quickly. So, like, it's difficult for me to plan for the future. Um, I mean, you know, right now, I'm able to go to college, hopefully medical school one day, but health can, my, health, my cystic fibrosis can catch up to me, and I might not even be able to graduate if I'm, you know, physically unable to. Um, so just being able to trust in God that uh, no matter what happens to me, um, no matter what happens to other people that I love, um, that he'll always be there has a, has a, meant a lot. And I think helps a lot of others too. So in closing, I'm going to close with Romans 8. Um, it's funny because I was talking to Mr. Wishart and I went back and reviewed his chapel from uh, last year. And for those of you that are here, you probably remember, um, his life first is John 16:33, and so is mine, but I, you know, I'm not going to steal his. So I'm going to close on a different verse. Romans 8, 35 and 39. And this is Paul speaking. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, and this is the Israelites in Psalms 44 uh, crying out to God, for, we, uh, for your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. And to this Paul responds, no. In all things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am not sure that neither death nor life nor angels nor rulers nor things present nor things to come nor powers nor height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Thank you. And thank you. Uh, that's, uh, that's, that's phenomenal. Thank you for putting yourself out there like that. Um, do that. So my encouragement to you, find something from what Jacob just shared and, and, and take it with you. Okay, perspective is very powerful, and you just got a half hour of, of uh, a very powerful um, kind of transformational stuff. So take, take something from that, and if you get a chance to thank Jacob later on, um, please, please do so. Um, let's pray, and then uh, I'm going to give you some room-flipping instructions for junior high lunch, which will start, which will start in a little bit. Father, um, I thank you for Jacob. Um, I thank you for um, what you're doing in his life um, and what you will continue to do in his life um, moving forward, just one day at a time. Um, just pray that you would go before him uh, as, he, uh, as he moves forward with... Uh, with his goals and his dreams, um, that you would sustain him um, throughout that time and continue to use him um, as you already are. And pray for his, his mom and his sister as well. Um, thank you that, uh, that the Greens are a part of the, the BCS family um, in such a, uh, a profound way. Thank you for this time. Uh, we can do this and just pray that we would all leave here, Lord, uh, a little wiser for the experience. In your name, amen. All right. Uh, I need freshman boys to help me flip the...